as an engineer. So I worked there for about five years as an engineer. And then I was working with some scientists, though, and I was just you know, really interested, you know, why are the scientists asking us to build these things and what kinds of questions were they they asking? Um, and so I decided to go back to school and study geophysics, try the science out, see if I liked it. And I really did. I really loved it. Um, all the science questions about astrobiology. You can see I, I started off by studying in the middle here. I studied hydrothermal vents. And these are places deep down in our ocean, you know, that are putting chemistry into the sea. And these could be potentially um, types of activity that happened on Mars in, in Mars's past. So I did some um, studies there on the hydrothermal systems that may have been active on Mars in the past. And then I got involved with folks who were studying icy ocean worlds, uh, for example, Europa, and I uh, got to do some research on the fractures that we see on the surface and how those cracks might be making their way through the ice uh, and enabling the ice in the ocean uh, to mix and pot uh, potentially make habitable environments on Europa. And I've gotten to do some field work and some laboratory work that you can see on the right. Um, but also, you know, just throughout my life, what kind of what drove me was just like, you know, adventure and like thinking about exploration. And I always wanted to be an astronaut, first first of all. Um, but then I got involved in, in, in more in the science and engineering side uh, and have gotten to do a lot of fun things. And that's just a little picture of my family that I've had uh, along the way here, us uh, going on our own little adventure in Iceland a few years ago. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but right now I am a research scientist at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab studying icy ocean worlds. And really what I'm really, um, what really drives a lot of my research is trying to understand habitability in our solar system. And, you know, the, the term astrobiology is such a like sort of large and encompassing term. It's a really exciting field because it's so interdisciplinary. You know, the study of astrobiology is about, is about studying the origins of life. Like how does life even start in places? You know, how has it evolved or how can it evolve in these different environments? You know, is it distributed throughout our solar system and in the, in the galaxies? And then the future of life potentially in our universe, um, how things evolve over time. So it's it's a really fun field because, you know, myself as a with my background in engineering and now in science and then working with others who have these other specialties in astronomy and biology and chemistry, my, myself a little bit more in the geology, geophysics size of things, you know, it takes people with all of those experience to really get at these really complex questions in astrobiology. And I, I just find that really um, fun and, and exciting because you're always learning, always um, learning different aspects on different things. And so, you know, this, this, this question of astrobiology and habitability and is life elsewhere in our universe, uh, in our solar system too, in our backyard, is it's a major focus of NASA's strategic plan for exploration. Um, but when we think about this, we, we think about these different places in our, in our solar system, in our universe, and we, we really try to have to, you know, we have to try to hone in, like we only, we only have so much money or so much time to like, think about and explore these places. And so we try to figure out what are the best places that have the most potential uh, for harboring um, life, as, at least as we know it. And maybe and there's a lot of folks thinking, too, about life as we don't know it. And so we try to think about where are the best places to look. And one of those places is these ocean worlds. You know, it's really only been in the fairly recent past that we've discovered there's so many of these ocean worlds in our solar system, uh, much less beyond, right? So we're, we're, we're exploring and, and discovering exoplanets all the time. But even in our own backyard, we have many ocean worlds. And I've, I've just kind of gathered a pictures of a few of those that you can see here. A, f a few of them I have a couple, you know, little question marks by. And actually, just this past week, I should have maybe did a highlight. There's actually even additional evidence now that just came out um, this past week about the meme, about Mimas at the Saturn system uh, as being um, uh, more sure. Than, we're more sure now that Mimas is also an ocean world. Um, but these worlds are all mostly ice-covered ocean worlds. So we see this icy crust on the outside, and it's through other lines of evidence that we're able to discern that they have ocean and liquid water beneath their icy uh, crusts. And so then one of the questions you might have is like, well, how do we even know there's oceans, you know, beneath? Because when we look at them, we see we see ice on the outside. Um, and of course, little Enceladus, which is which is just the, this gem of a moon out at, at Saturn, is a really exciting place because we know it has water beneath because it's spewing water out into uh, into space uh, from its south polar terrain. 
Um, and so that's one way that we know that there's oceans. But for the other ones, we have we don't really see we see tantalizing uh, signals sometimes about maybe potential geyser activity similar to Enceladus, but we we don't know for sure. So we look we we have other ways of trying to figure that out. And then as we try to understand the activity there, we we start to ask about this question of how habitable are these worlds, these ocean worlds. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly in on Europa because that's, you know, the Europa Clipper mission. We're going there and it's what I've been studying for over 10 years now um, in the past 10 years since I've started with looking at these icy moons. And it's um, the second largest, second of the larger uh, Galilean moons, the Galilean satellites of Jupiter. And you can see the so there's Io, which is that really sulfuric, volcanically active moon closest to, uh, uh, to Jupiter. And then we have Europa which is about the size of our moon. And then we have Ganymede, which is a very large um, icy moon. And then Callisto, which is our uh, extremely battered, you can see very cratered um, icy moon um, at, at Jupiter. And the Galileo spacecraft explored these moons um, from about 1995 to 2003. And that's where we have a lot of our previous data on Europa from. So in order to understand, you know, whether um, there's oceans beneath, one of the ways that we can uh, explore this is through looking for an induced magnetic field at these, at these worlds. Because if the water, if that ocean water is a salty water ocean, that could give us the conductive pathway basically for an induced magnetic field at, at these worlds. And the reason we don't think that um, these worlds would have their own um, magnetic field is that they're smaller, and the, and the idea is that through their evolution, they wouldn't have gotten that liquid portion of an iron core that would be the conductive um, material to make their have their own internal field. So that instead, they're able, though, to ha have this induced magnetic field that you can kind of see as Jupiter orbits. It has these magnetic fields that pass through Europa. And when Galileo, that mission, that previous mission, flew by Europa, it, it detected that magnetic field. And then when we go back with Clipper, you'll see up here is just a little chart that we're going to even get to be able to get more information. We also have a magnetometer that's going to go on the Europa Clipper spacecraft. And we're going to make measurements and we're going to be able to tell things um, that will indicate even the, the levels of salinity, but also tell us uh, which is co connected to the conductivity measurements. Uh, and so we can we can tell some more about the conductivity and then also that can inform us about the ocean thickness um, that's present. Because we have a good idea based on the gravity measurements and the things about the physics that tell us as we fly by a moon um, what its structure is like, um, but, but it doesn't well constrain yet the thickness of the water versus the thickness of the ice that's overlying that water. So that's what we're trying to get at, too, is understanding the, the differences in the ice and the, the liquid layers there. And so this is um, a graphic showing you a little bit more information about what we do know about Europa's interior so far. So at the left, you can see, you know, there's, there is an iron core, but again, we don't think there's this liquid um, portion of the iron core there. And then it has a rocky mantle and then a pretty thin, when you look at it overall, layer of, of ocean, of liquid water, and then an ice shell on top. And so again, you know, Europe is about the size of our moon, um, but, but that thickness, it doesn't look very thick there, although that is 100 kilometers or so uh, thick uh, liquid and ice, ice layer there. Um, also, one of the interesting things is to think about is like these worlds are really far out from the sun. And so they have to have a way, you know, how are they even keeping that layer of water liquid? Um, why is it not all completely frozen? And one of the reasons is because as Europa goes around Jupiter, it's in an elliptical orbit. So sometimes it's a little closer, sometimes a little further away. And that motion as it, as it goes around Jupiter, it's kind of like our tides on the Earth, but it's all inside that ice shell. So as it's going, it's being squeezed as it gets close, and then it's moving away, it's relaxing and squeezing. And that motion, actually, you can see, um, which is represented in this figure by this, this reddish region here, that frictional heat is being created inside. And so that heat, then, is what helps keep that liquid water liquid. And um, some of that heat is also um, actually um, acting and focusing in on that uh, ice shell. And that's part of um, what a the scientists are trying to better understand, you know, how that's interacting with the ice itself as well. But then that can lead us to, um, is there potential at Europa for the hydrothermal activity? So again, just to back up, we're getting that, that heat in here and the interior and that, and that crust. And then that heat could potentially act activate the, the sea floor, where before we used to look at these worlds as such as Mars, where we would see water on the surface and that would say, oh, that might be a habitable region. 
But now if there's the potential for hydrothermal activity on these icy worlds at their seafloor, we might get activity such as you, that's shown here. So this is looking at our, into our oceans at our seafloor where we get a lot of activity um, at, at the seafloor. And you know, this is down deep, down deep in the ocean where there's no sunlight reaching down there, but yet there's a lot of chemistry. And when we explored there, we found life. Like there is life down there in the seafloor of, of these of our oceans, and that really opened up the possibility for these icy worlds far out where the sunlight can't penetrate through the ice shell. But but yet there might be this hydrothermal activity that's providing chemistry into the oceans and providing a, an environment that maybe life could take hold. So so we started to think about Europa, Enceladus, Titan, these these icy ocean worlds that may also be habitable environments. So again, um, just to look again, kind of at a cross-section view of what we think Europa's like. Uh, we think that it has this, you know, ice ocean layer of about 100 to 120 kilometers in thickness. In that ice, it's cracks. There might be little water pockets. There could be diapirs of warmer ice coming towards the surface and creating all the really interesting um, morphologies and cracks along the surface that we see. We also know that there's a lot of radiation. So Jupiter has a, has a lot of strong radiation and it's, it's um, changing some of the chemistry on the surface from that irradiation. And then if there's any chance that there's hydrothermal activity on the, on the seafloor and that the, the compositions that can be mixing potentially between the surface and the, the seafloor and mixing and creating a habitable environment for, for life. Another really interesting fact is, is that even though Europa is the size of our moon, which we think of as being kind of small, you know, if you took all the water on the surface of the earth and you put it into a little sphere, and then you took all the water on Europa in this 100, 120 kilometer thick region, and you made them into spheres, you would actually have two times more water on Europa than you do liquid water, right, in Europa than, than the oceans and rivers on the earth. So it's a lot of water. And of course, we, we know that life needs a way to mix uh, and uh, have processes happen. And water is, is usually the way we think of that happening. So, so Europa might be this habitable environment. It could have the ingredients for life. And so as we think we, as we structured the science questions for Europa Clipper, we, we came um, up with these, these ways of thinking about the water, the chemistry and the energy. And if we have all of these, uh, these things, these parameters that could fit in such a way that we think life uh, could use, then we really think that, that Europa has a habitable environment. And so these are some of the questions that we're really gonna be going after with, with Europa Clipper mission, trying to better characterize the environment there and telling how habitable um, Europa might be. And so with that, I'm going to kind of delve now into a little bit more uh, details about the mission itself. Uh, so Europa Clipper is going to launch in October of this year, which is like mind boggling. We can't believe it's here already. Um, almost time. Uh, and so here's a nice uh, picture, a, a graphic of what we think, you know, Europa Clipper is going to look at, like as it's flying by the surface of Europa. Uh, we have radar antennas that kind of hang off here off, off the, the wings, our solar array wings. Um, and so I'll, I'll delve more into um, where the instruments are and what, what they are, but the really the overarching question, you know, for this mission is to explore Europa and investigate its habitability. We have uh, three main science objectives is to characterize the ice shell and ocean, better understand the composition, uh, really explore and characterize the geology, um, which is geology, right? You think about rocks, but we kind of use the same term for ice, ice geology. Um, and then one other thing that we're going to do with all of this exploration is do um, some some reconnaissance. So we're going to take lots of really high uh, high resolution images as well as uh, compositional measurements, and and that's the, an effort such that if we can go back in the near future and find uh, a great place to land, a scientifically interesting place, uh, that we might want to land and do further exploration and look for signs of life. Uh, the, and we're also going to be doing a lot of characterization to look for current and recent activity. So between when Galileo mission was there and took uh, images and then Europa Clippers coming, uh, we're going to look for any changes between those as well as any um, actually acti activity that's happening now, like plume, plume activity. 
So that was like um, quite a bit of excitement in the past few years. We have had sort of tantalizing uh, measurements um, by the Hubble Space Telescope of potential plume activity at Europa. So the, the image on the left here is, is showing um, a signal that was, it was kind of on the hairy edge of the signal to noise, um, but it did show indication that there could be um, a plume happening there. There have been follow-on measurements that haven't been able to identify the same type of activity. So what we think is that potentially uh, at Europa, it's harder to image this because you know Europa is larger, um, it has higher gravity, so the plumes may not reach as high to get off the limb there where you're trying to image it. Um, also, uh, you know the um, the periodicity of the activity might not be as um, sort of constant as what we see in Enceladus, where the the geyser activity is happening all the time right now. And so that is one of the questions too, as we explore Europa, is comparing it to other ocean worlds such as Enceladus. You know, is the activity if we if we observe it at Europa, is it similar to what we see at Enceladus? Can that also tell us about what might be happening in the subsurface? But for Europa Clipper, um, we're going to launch here. Uh, uh, you know, launch in uh, October 10th is the win the window um, opening. Uh, so if we launch the first day of our window, it'll be October 10th, and then we'll we'll head out. And I lost my cursor. Okay, so here, so here we head out. Um, we do uh, first we do a Mars gravity assist, which happens only a few months later in February of 25, and then we come back around. Keep losing my cursor. Okay, keep come back around. We do an Earth gravity assist. Actually, turns out turns out it's on my birthday, <laughs> December 2026. Uh, so I'm going to have a flyby party and wave to Clipper as it flies by. Um, but then it'll head on out from there out to the Jupiter system. And uh, so we're going to arrive in April of 2030. And then it takes us some time to kind of uh, bring our orbit down to then start doing orbits um, of Europa. And that'll we'll do our first Europa flyby in March of 2031. So that, that entire time of flight takes us about uh, five and a half years uh, to get out there. Okay, um, and so as, as you heard me say, we're actually orbiting Jupiter. So, and the reason for that, again, is because we have um, about, uh, we have a three and a half year mission and, we, and during that time we get to do 49 flybys. And the reason that we're orbiting Jupiter and just doing flybys of Europa is because the, the point at which we fly by Europa is our closest point to Jupiter. And then we kind of swing back out again and then come back by. And the reason is, is we want to, we're kind of dipping our toes into that harsher radiation environment of which Europa is within. Um, and so that way we can last our, the longest because over time that radiation is going to kill our electronics. Uh, and so uh, we, we've um, maxed out our mission to be below four megarads of radiation buildup over time. And we do expect that hopefully we'll still be we'll still be running strong at that point. We'll be able to do an extended mission, but but right now this is the scope of our of our prime mission, as we call it. Uh, and so you can see how the the it almost looks like one of those fun spiral graphs you might do as a kid and and make some pretty pictures. But the reason for that is as you can see, they kind of um, rotate around, and we're we're going to be able to fly by Europa different places in its orbit around Jupiter and get um, both uh, subjovian and anti-Jovian measurements. So Europa is also like our moon in that it keeps its same face facing Jupiter all the time. So we're gonna fly by the, the near side first and then the far side of Europa. And that's what you can see then on the right, we call our web of, of flybys there, um, but we're mostly covering the sub and anti-Jovian hemispheres. Now we do get a full globe picture and, and measurements, but from further out, um, you know, lower resolutions. Um, but you can see by the color scheme how close we are getting with each flyby. And so the closest flybys we can get as close, we're going to get as close as 25 kilometers, um, which is really exciting. We're going to get um, uh, images on the order of half a meter um, per pixel uh, images, which is just fantastic uh, high resolution images. Uh, and then we're going to take, um, you know, further out 50, 400, 1,000 and further out um, uh, measurements as we swing in and swing by and then fly back out. Okay, uh, and then so on board uh, the Europa Clipper spacecraft, we have 10 um, science investigations. The ones that are circled there in gold are, are in situ measurements. Um, and I kind of do quotes because sometimes uh, in situ is used to say, okay, in situ is where you're digging into the ice and you're taking measurements. But rather here, we're talking about in situ being in the environment. So, so for example, our mass specs is our mass spectrometer. 
and the SUDA um, dust analyzer are very similar. They, they're instruments that actually have openings on the spacecraft that as they fly through any particles that are either getting kicked up off the surface by micro, micrometeorite impacts or plume activity, as we fly through that material, it's collected and they can do this in situ analysis to tell us about the composition of those particles. The um, ECM is our magnetometer, Europa Clipper magnetometer. And we also have PIMS, which is a plasma instrument. And those are instruments that are in the, the space and plasma physics environment. So those are gonna do measurements of Europa's um, induced magnetic field and then also the plasma environment, both near Europa and then for, further out as we do our fly, flybys around. And then we have our gravity radio science uh, investigation, which is actually using the, um, the signals that we're sending, the communication signals to and from Earth um, and uh, using that to tell uh, the, about the structure. It, it can tell us about the structure of Europa. And then uh, circled in blue, uh, we have our remote sensing instruments. So we have a Europa uh, ultraviolet spectrograph, which tells us, uh, uses the wavelengths of light to um, tell us about the composition. We have our ICE cameras. It's actually a suite of two cameras. There's a narrow angle camera and a wide angle camera. And those will take just amazing pictures of the surface. Uh, we also have um, the, an IR spectrometer, the MISE instrument, which will tell us a lot about the surface composition. E-Themis is our thermal imager. It's gonna tell us about if there's any warmer regions. So in this picture in the background, you can kind of see a depiction of what may be a warm region of, of slushy, watery ice is coming closer to the surface. We would see potentially a thermal signature at the surface. And then we have an ice penetrating radar, which is called Reason. Um, and it's kind of fun. There's a, an, a sister instrument on the ESA, the Euro European Space Agency's mission, the JUICE mission that's already on its way out there. Uh, and there, that sister instrument is called RIME. So there's reason in RIME, um, ice penetrating radars going out to the Jupiter system. Uh, and so, you know, just to talk a little bit about Europa itself, you know, the surface of Europa, and this is what we're going to get these amazing new pictures of to tell us if there's any changes from before, but you can see just how varied and interesting the surface of Europa is. And all of these, you know, these ridge plains, these chaos where it looks like there's like icebergs almost that have broken off and maybe floated along in some more, you know, um, malleable or, or you know, uh, fluidic uh, subsurface that allowed it to kind of flow and then turn and, and turn sideways. Uh, we see a few craters, not very many on the surface of Europa. We see these tiny little, um, some are uh, divots and some are, are like little domes. And this is uh, affectionately, we call these the freckles on Europa. But we see all of these like extremely interesting features on the surface. And this is what's telling us that Europa is an active world just in the geologic sense, right? In the, in the last 50 million years, this is about the age range of this surface of Europa. And this is, this is very geologically young, you know, for, for these bodies. And so we've, we've come to understand that Europa is an active world in the geologic sense. And then the ice cameras, this is just an example of like how much um, higher resolution imagery we expect to get and how just exciting Europa's surface is and, you know, would be very challenging for a lander, but very exciting, exciting world. Um, so you can see just like zooming in and, and thinking about also the compositional information that we'll be able to get on these worlds, zooming in and in and in and trying to look for, for maybe what a future lander could, could use as a safe spot to land. Um, and then just to highlight again, some of the, the really exciting science that's gonna come back from our instruments. Uh, this is the remote uh, sensing in investigations. So MISE is our infrared spectroscopic imager where we're gonna really be able to look at, you know, what would be a visible image here where we see really interesting reddish features, you know, investigating those and getting more information about whether there's organics in there, whether those are different types of salts are there any um, thermal image, you know, so this, this instrument, this IR spectroscopy, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm like getting dry in my mouth. Um, this IR measurement is also actually gonna overlap a bit with our Ethemis um, uh, thermal imager. And so they, both of these together will tell us a little bit about that, you know, if there's any warm spots and just uh, further information um, about the compositions of the ice. 
Europa UVS is going to look off the limbs and look for evidence and uh, for uh, compositional measurements of any plume activity. And then the reason infrared, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the, the reason uh, ice penetrating radar is going to actually be able to tell us about the structure within the ice. All of these instruments, as I mentioned, we're getting close to launch. All of these instruments have been delivered. And here are some just little cameos of the instruments themselves that you can see. Um, one sort of telltale instrument you can always notice is this big uh, sort of telescopic uh, portion of the NAC, the narrow angle camera that comes off the side of the spacecraft. Uh, all of these, you can see these silvery things. These are um, the thermal blankets. So everything has to be blanket, blanketed to keep, um, you know, keep them warm as we head out uh, to the outer solar system. But they're all delivered and, and we're awaiting um, now final um, uh, spacecraft tests to, to complete. Uh, and then again, for the in situ investigations, these are gonna tell us a lot about the composition of the particles. One really uh, uh, exciting thing that the SUDA instrument can do is actually tell us a little bit about where those particles um, came from on the surface. And what could be exciting about this is that as we fly over certain types of features on the surface, like a double ridge or a chaos terrain, uh, we might be able to say, oh, that really interesting composition came from that feature over there. And that could indicate to us more about how those features are made and whether there's potential for um, subsurface material to have come to the surface recently. Um, and then we also, again, are going to explore the space and plasma environment um, with the PIMS, the plasma instrument. We have some radiation monitors on there to learn more about the radiation environment and then the Europa Clipper magnetometer. And these instruments have all been um, delivered as well. Uh, you can see this is the mass spec. It has a very long tubular form, form so it's bouncing the particles back and forth in order to separate them and allow them to be measured. Uh, the particle detector here, which the, the, the particles actually impact onto the surface and then are measured for their composition. Um, the magnetometer and the PIMS, um, those are all uh, instruments that have to be on long beams um, to get them away from the spacecraft itself. So the spacecraft will have its own magnetic field and these instruments don't wanna measure the spacecraft's magnetic field. They need to be far off and, and uh, measuring uh, what's happening in the environment that they're with. It. Okay, um, I'm going to send you now on a ride along with Europa space spacecraft. Uh, so if you look over here to the right where my cursor is, there's your little, little Europa that we're getting closer to. You'll see little scans that are happening up here. It'll indicate which instrument is being used. It'll also highlight it down here on the bottom left. Um, most of the time, our solar arrays have to be pointed towards the Earth, right, to be pointed towards the sun. And, uh, but at, um, when we get close enough, the, because our radar uh, are actually on the solar arrays, they rotate so that the, the radar can um, start pointing towards Europa. Um, but, but this is just a fun little ride here uh, to send you on. Uh, as you can see, we can do also uh, full spacecraft scans where we rotate the whole spacecraft, but that's done kind of more minimally. Uh, but all the instruments are co-boresighted and pointed together so that we can get multiple measurements of, of across very dis different disciplines, sometimes all in the same locations at the same time. And that's really powerful for allowing us to get um, just amazing science. And that was just the rotation you saw here. So now the rays, radar antennas are pointed towards the surface. And we fly by going pretty fast, about four and a half kilometers per second as we fly by the Europa and we take data then, you could see on the way in and then also looking back and uh, taking data on the way out. Um, here are some recent pictures of, of the um, spacecraft as it was going through integration and test. Uh, so uh, here starting on the right in the upper side is the spacecraft put on its side so that it allows the folks who are working on it um, to be working on it off this little bit of scaffolding they have there. Uh, right now in this picture, this is not a current uh, picture, but before they would have to do um, sort of patterning of where the, all the thermal blankets were going to go. So that's what this, this white colored material is, um, were the patterns for that. Um, on the left is a picture of the vault. So as I mentioned, uh, we're going into a very high radiation environment. So we have what we call a vault that is a very protected area where you can see all the cabling and most of our, the electronics for, this, for the um, instruments and the spacecraft, uh, where it's more protected than from that radiation environment. 
Here's a picture of the solar arrays. These were built, built by a European company called Airbus. And so uh, here in their facility, you can see they have them um, you know, attached and put together. We have these two we call wings. And when those two wings are unfolded, once we get out into space, uh, we Europa Clipper will be about the length of a basketball court if you go from one wing tip to the other. Uh, and then here is our high gain uh, antenna. So this is a big um, you know, circular piece that attaches on the side of the spacecraft and that's what's gonna send all of our data to and from, um, from Earth. Oh, and I, uh, I mentioned up here, we are, we're playing right now. This, the, the whole spacecraft is, is on its way up the hill at JPL uh, to go through its last thermal vacuum uh, test as a whole spacecraft. And then once that's complete, we are planning to ship uh, to the Cape in May. We also had a really fun uh, campaign that was done where we teamed up with the uh, US poet laureate Ada Lamon, uh, who wrote a really nice poem uh, to go along with the Europa mission. And um, this has been engraved now on the side of, of, the, of, of a panel that will be attached to the side of the spacecraft. And unfortunately, I can't advertise for you to get a chance to sign up, but we had a campaign to get people to, to sign their names. And from all over the world, we had 2.6 million signees um, who were who have signed on to have their name etched in very small and be sent uh, along with the spacecraft as well. But I do encourage you to go to uh, the Clipper website, europa.nasa.gov, where you can you can keep up with all the latest happenings uh, of the mission and the spacecraft as we're as we're sent getting down to the Cape and and going to launch later this year. Uh, there is a um, so those pictures that I showed you earlier of the of the spacecraft and the vault and the solar panels. Those were all pictures of um, the clean room at JPL where we have a live webcam. Unfortunately, I just mentioned, you know, the, the spacecraft being rolled up the hill to go to Thermalvac. So it's not in the in the camera right now, but um, I'm, there's potential it'll come back one last time before um, uh, it gets sent um, down to uh, to Florida for launch. Uh, so I just, you know, I'll, I think I'm going to share these slides with you guys, I'm pretty sure, and uh, you can um, have that. But probably if you just, it's a YouTube uh, live feed, so if you just uh, slip, uh, search for Clipper, uh, you should be able to find it. Um, so then I, as I mentioned, I wanted to just uh, brief, you, brief you all a little bit on future missions as well. Uh, so, you know, for a strategy for ocean world exploration, and, and the same was for, for Mars, right, the idea would be that you fly by a planet, or a moon and you, you, you take a lot of this reconnaissance data, learn more about it, then you find a good place to land. You might go and land and dig into the, the near surface, look for signs of life, do more geophysics and geology. And then the idea would be to rove. And of course on Mars, it's always been with our cool little rovers. But when we think about ocean worlds, when, when we say rove, really what we wanna do is rove through the surface. We wanna go through that ice shell, you know, taking lots of interesting measurements on the way, but then getting down to that ocean and really um, exploring the ocean of these ocean worlds. Um, so, so leading up to that, you know, you, you would want to land, you'd want to do further further science and, and get more information. And, and especially on worlds like Europa and Enceladus, where maybe that material is coming towards the surface, you could even start to look for signs of life there. And so the Europa lander mission concept was a study that was done that really looked in detail of what kind, about what kinds of measurements you'd want to make, as well as how many, um, how would you make a decision about where to dig. Um, and so we, we did a lot of analysis on, on coming up with the, with the mission concept. And so this is just some information here um, to, uh, to give to you about um, some of the mission uh, ideas that have come forward. So Sending things like a gas chromatograph, mass spectrometer to GCMS could um, look for signs of um, organics, um, amino acids, the building blocks for life. Um, a microscope maybe even could look for cellular structures. Raman spectrometer and context cameras giving further information about any um, biosignatures that might be present. And then you'd also want to further characterize the habitability of that, that near surface environment. Um, and also the context information. So whenever, you know, looking for signs of life somewhere, it's, it's a, hard, a hard thing to do when you think about, okay, I'm gonna land on just one place and then I'm gonna use this information to say whether or not this, this whole large world has life or not. And you don't, you know, when you, when you either find signs or you don't find anything, you know, is that because you looked in the right place or, you know, maybe there was too much noise, you know, you weren't as prepared with your sample 
handling and the things you need to do to get rid of that noise. Um, and so a lot of questions come into play. It's a very complex question. And so when you want to say there's life here or there's not life here, you need to also understand a lot more about the the world itself. And that's the context information that's also important to understand. And so we have several other instruments that are called out here as well. Um, but I could just point you, there was a real full study that was done on this mission concept. And if you're interested, there's a nice um, PDF of that that's available to anyone who's interested. The idea for that mission concept was to, to land in a similar way to the Mars rovers, um, how they landed with a sky crane. And so this is just a couple images um, showing that landing process, very similar to the Mars landers. And then you can see um, as you're on the surface of Europa, you'd be digging into this very cold ice, right? So this, this ice is 100 Kelvin. It's almost considered to be like concrete. Um, and so you have to come up with uh, really innovative tools uh, to use to get into the ice and then also be able to scoop it and bring it into the lander and then do the processing and analysis that you want to do there. Another similar mission concept that's been studied recently is to go back to Enceladus. So Enceladus here is a nice um, set of images that were put together. This actual images of the Cassini mission as it came and approached Enceladus. And you can see the geyser activity at the south polar terrain there. But to go, um, Enceladus orbit lander would go and, and fly through the plume several times and then also land. And uh, you can see a funnel here it would collect um, the, the plume material as it fell back down to the surface. And it would also dig and, and, and do very similar analyses to what the Europa Lander mission concept would do. Um, however, one interesting thing just to highlight is this nanopore sequencer, um, because if we think a place is inhabited, we may wanna look actually even for signs of DNA types of biomolecules. And a nanopore sequencer could do that. Um, and there's these little nanopore sequencers right now that are available for, for use in the field on, on Earth. And they're not quite really flight ready. Um, but the idea that you could actually bring in material and, and put it into a little um, opening, which is like the pore, where the pore, it passes through the pore, and then the signals get read. And you can actually characterize DNA strands uh, using these types of instrumentation. So sending something like that to a, a world that you think might be inhabited could be really um, interesting um, to get data back from. Uh, and then again, uh, the, the follow on mission idea, and I've been um, on a team that's been looking into this a bit more too, is to think about actually roving you know, into the subsurface. And so we call these cryobots uh, to that would do subsurface exploration. And the idea here is that you, you would go through the ice um, and we estimate these ice shells could be pretty thick on the order of 10 kilometers or so thick. And you'd have to get through that ice shell in a few years. Uh, and so it's a very challenging environment to have to survive, um, but it would do the, the same kind of science as a lander, but then through the subsurface. And so looking for signs of life, better understanding the habitability, and then uh, looking for that context information in the surface and subsurface. Um, the, the part that my team's been focusing on is thinking about the communication. So just making your way through these, these, uh, this harsh environment is one thing, but then you also have to think that this, this way that you have communicating back to the surface and sending that all important data either to uh, you know, another portion that's orbiting and then sending the data back to Earth or direct back to Earth. But it's really important to have that, that communication line, right? So, so we've been thinking about um, a communication optical fiber tether that could be tethered to that surface module or also RF repeaters. And those are um, wavelengths of, of signal that can go through the ice actually um, and, and potentially hop over any bra break in your tether. Because as we look at Europa, we see lots of cracks and fractures. And, and the thought is, is that there's actually kind of tectonic activity happening on Europa as it goes around and is flexing, right? Remember when we talked about the tidal flexing? Um, so uh, it could be having fault activity. So how do we make sure that any tether that we would use in our communication is robust to that? So we've been actually using um, a rig uh, that um, our colleagues at Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory up in New York, they have a rig where we can freeze a tether across three blocks of ice and we can hold this whole system at, at cryogenic temperatures. Oops, sorry. And uh, here's the, an actual picture of the setup. So we've frozen in this tether across these three blocks. And then what you, do, what you can do is load that central block 
and cause shear across the two blocks that are that are held in place as the center one moves. And so that's what we've been doing at the various temperatures that we expect for Europa's ice shells. We've been loading a tether. And these tethers, I should have mentioned, um, are tethers that have been used by um, our, our colleagues at Woods Hole um, up in Massachusetts uh, for their submersibles. Uh, so they've been doing work in the Arctic and things where they have to pass tethers through ice layers at the surface and then have their submersible um, swimming around beneath looking, uh, doing ocean exploration. So those are the, the tethers that we've tested and we're just doing a lot of of testing for that. Um, and so, but then we have other missions, right? Another exciting mission that's going uh, to Titan is the Dragonfly mission. Uh, Titan is an, a, an ocean world at Saturn. It has a photochemical atmosphere, organic rich surface, methane and ethane on the surface. It has an ice, water ice crust and a subsurface ocean. And the questions there for astrobiology, you know, we really are trying to understand what kind of complex organics are formed in the atmosphere. How have they been physically and chemically uh, modified on the surface? And do they interact with that subsurface ocean? And so the Dragonfly mission, I, I wanted to just um, bring this up kind of briefly here, but I wanted to let you all know too, of course, you know, there's colleagues of mine uh, that are on this mission at APL and the PI, you know, her office is a few offices down from mine <laughs> at work. And so I'm sure, you know, you should reach out to these folks because they could give you a whole, whole lot more information on this amazing mission. Um, but this mission is planned for launch in 2028. And the idea here, right, when, when we say rove for this mission, it's a quadcopter. It's going to fly around on the surface of, of Titan. And the reason is, is so Titan's a moon. Um, and it's got a really, really dense uh, atmosphere. So it's, it's actually easier to fly on Titan than it is on Earth. And so uh, with that dense atmosphere, this, this quadcopter, which is about the size of a Mini Cooper, okay, is able to fly around on Titan, we'll, we'll be able to fly around on Titan and take measurements um, all over the surface of Titan. Very, very exciting mission. Um, and so uh, its mission is again also to think about astrobiology. And so it'll come, it'll be drop downs, but kind of similar, you know, to the, to the Mars missions, but then it's going to actually release and fly on its own power down to the surface. Uh, and so as it lands, it'll take samples. It'll look for prebiotic chemistry. It's going to better determine how habitable an environment Titan has, and also uh, do some searching for, for biosignatures, looking for chemical evidence um, in the building blocks for life. And then another thing that I'm involved in, so again, you know, I mentioned that I was an engineer first and I can't ever get away from that. I don't want to, you know, I, I love that intersection of engineering and science. And I've gotten to work with a biologist at APL and we've been working a lot about thinking about the challenging environments of these ocean worlds and how so the salts in these environments, as well as other chemistries, would be confounding to the downstream analyses when you're looking for things like amino acids or biopolymers. And so we've been focusing a lot on building devices that can purify those samples first before you do your analyses. Um, and this is an example of a system that we've, we've developed for amino acids uh, where you can bring in the sample that has salts and sulfur and other maybe sulfuric acid uh, and separate the amino acids from those harsh chemistries and then do your analysis with a higher, much higher than signal to noise. And then we're also doing a similar type of sample prep system for the biopolymers, such as, you know, biopolymers being long chained DNA, RNA like um, biosignatures. Um, so we, we do think that if these are in existence at these worlds, they would be very low levels. So we first want to concentrate them. We would disrupt them um, and then purify them. And so uh, then they would be able to be sent to these small devices, as I mentioned, the nanopore sequencers. Then we also have been working a little bit um, on uh, decontamination uh, sort of processes. So of course, when we take these things to other worlds, we don't want to leave anything behind that would maybe alter life if it's the, the life that's there or release life that we may have accidentally brought with us or, or just have with us in our experiments that would leave any kind of trash behind, right? So we've been working on a, a way to decontaminate um, once we're done with our experiments. And so with that, I'd just like to say onward to Europa and Ocean Worlds. We have this fantastic mission, uh, the Europa Clipper mission that's going, launching later this year. We have Dragonfly, which is gonna do some amazing um, uh, exploration of Titan that's launching in 2038. 
I'm sorry, 20, yes, 2028. <laughs> and then um, in the future, you know, we hope to go back and land on these worlds. We're working on devices to do sample processing. And then someday in the future, we want to rove and get into the oceans of these exciting worlds. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and I hope I have some time to take questions. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Certainly appreciate all the information on all the different programs that are going on. And yes, like I remember, I'm wearing here. Yeah, that, there <clears throat> okay, so yes, I'm sure we do have some questions. Or do you have any questions in here first? Let me start off here. We've only got set, we have eight here, so let them go first. The mic is not live now. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right. So, hey, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting to hear. A um, couple of questions came to mind as you were you were talking through things, and um, they kind of bounced all over the place with with what you were talking about. But um, okay. so you mentioned that there was some new news about Mimas that had characterized it as a as a an ocean world. Could you give us a little information about that? That's part one. Um, number two is, uh, what kind of, so I'm hoping to appeal to the engineer in you with this, what kind of launch vehicle is needed for the clipper? I know when we, uh, put the probe out to Pluto, we had to use one of the heaviest launch vehicles on earth. Are we using similar heavy duty, uh, work on this one? And then finally with the dragonfly, What's the power source going to be for that? Because you don't have uh, solar power that's that's really useful for that. But when you got something the size of a Mini Cooper in an atmosphere that promotes flight, I don't know. Can you get away with the nuclear power source for that, or how are you going to make that one work? Anyway, <laughs> over to you. All right, great. All great questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so the first question was about the Mimas finding, and this it's, it is very recent, and I unfortunately haven't read the paper myself yet, but I know it's come out in Nature Astronomy um, just, uh, let's see, it wasn't last week, it was the week before, the end of um, week before last. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. I think it had to do, um, you know, with previous measurements and um, some modeling, I believe, that was done to to, to better understand how um, because I think the question has been usually about the geology and the how, um, you know, they weren't quite able to, to sync the geology with uh, the idea that it could be an ocean world. Um, but I think that there's been some advances now that have allowed them to make those um, sort of make sense and make the connections. Um, but um, let's see. So then your next question uh, was, oh, the launch vehicle. So we are we are going on the um the Falcon Heavy. Uh, and so uh, we were originally actually slated to go on the SLS, but then there were some, you know, delays, I think, in the SLS, and they, they were prioritizing that for the astronauts, uh, for Artemis. So uh, we um, were put onto the Falcon Heavy, um, which is going to be a pretty cool launch. I haven't gone in person yet to see any of the, the boosters, you know, come back down. So that'll be fun. Um, but um, yeah, that's where we're, we're going on the, the Falcon Heavy. Uh, and then uh, for Titan, for, for uh, Dragonfly, yes, you're right. We, so we, we have to use for that a nuclear power s source. And so I don't know if you remember in the image, but it kind of has this, it, I mean, it helps it kind of look like a bug in a way, but it's that, that cylinder that's kind of sticking off the back of the Dragonfly spacecraft. That's the RTG. And they are, you know, there are challenges when you are in a, an environment like Titan where there is convection because of the, the dense atmosphere and figuring out the whole, um, the thermal challenge with the RTGs there because you have, it's a very cold world, but then the the, the cooling and the, the heat transfer of getting the heat away when you have all that heat coming from your power source. Um, so they are, they're actually, oh, it's, it's really, really cool. I should have put a picture in, but we've, they built this huge chamber at APL um, and it's um, to do that, it's to, to mimic the convection environment at Titan, but they call it the Titan, the, the chamber's called the Titan. And um, it's really big, but it's really interesting. Most thermal vacuum chambers you'll see are big cylinders, um, but this one is a big cube. So I don't know, it's just a really neat um, chamber. If you ever come up to APL and uh, take a tour, uh, definitely ask to see the Titan um, chamber. <laughs> it's pretty neat. 
Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions from online or anyone else here in the room? There's a lot of information there, a lot of good information. Um, Mike? Yeah, hi. Um, just wondering, the probe that you're going to use to penetrate the ice, how do you intend to um, actually penetrate the ice? Are you going to have some kind of thermal source for that? or? Yeah. Great question. Um, so, so at the surface, it's a very challenging um, question actually to to actually initiate the penetration. That might actually need to be a kind of a combination drill and maybe some thermal melting. But, but, but we are going to also have a um, radiogenic heat source uh, that would then heat the the front end of the cryobot so that it's melting its way through, basically. So once you get through uh, into the sur subsurface, just enough to be able to build up that thermal heat transfer more efficiently, then then you can rely on that to to melt your way down uh, through. So there are, you know, we have are doing research on um, ways to avoid uh, either um, ice lay uh, sorry, not ice uh, salt layers or or layers that are not ice because it would make it more challenging then to to melt your way through those. Um, and so that's some of the challenges that that folks are working on um, as well. But it's it's mostly going to be the heat transfer, the melting uh, through the through the ice. We have one more. Well, got another question, uh, Victoria. Hi. Um, has NASA considered ice coring as another way to research Europa? Yeah, and Victoria, do you mean by that like taking a core of ice and and studying yes. that ice core? Yeah, yeah. So that's like the one of the some of the questions that we're still kind of you know debating or or um, trade doing trades on is is the best way you know what would be the best way to sample. Um, so some of the the tools that you saw on the Europa lander have been mostly cutting and just kind of digging um, into that subsurface, but people have been trying to think about actually doing a core um, sample. And the, you know, the wonderful thing about doing core sampling is that you can see, see the layers and you can, you know, understand more about where the sample was, you know, um, initially, and then you pull it out and you're able to do analyses on that. So people are um, uh, thinking about that. I think it is maybe a potentially a little bit more of a challenging type of sample processing once you take the ice core. Um, but definitely that's done in the field um, and it would be a, a way to get some really interesting information about the ice. Thanks. Okay, Paul, I think you've got a question. Yeah, what, what happens in the satellite after the last flyby? Does it just continue to orbit uh, Europa indefinitely? Yeah, great question. Um, so right now our end of, of life um, uh, plan is to crash into Ganymede. So as I mentioned, Ganymede's that next um, further moon out of the Galilean satellites. And so it's a really, really large icy moon. And um, the reason that it's okay for us to crash land on Ganymede is because as we understand it, Ganymede has an extremely thick ice shell. So there's very little potential for us to contaminate its ocean um, where, you know, the or the more habitable region where it would be warm enough to have, um, you know, an environment. So that's uh, the plan right now. Um, and I didn't actually get to mention a couple of the cool things about, so while we're out at Europa, our Europa Clippers focused on Europa, and then the ESA mission, uh, the JUICE mission is focusing on Ganymede. But it does do a couple of flybys of Europa as well. And right now, I mean, our trajectory might change a little bit depending on when we actually launch and things. But right now, there's a flyby where we fly by Europa. We each each of the spacecraft flies by Europa within four hours of each other. So it would just be an amazing chance for for science, and then also maybe we get to take pictures of each other. But but then after we land or we crash land and have our end of life. Um, there's potential that that ESA mission could actually um, do science or take images of our crash crash site as well because they'll still be um, out at, at Ganymede. Now we may also do an extended mission. We hope we will. Um, and but the plan would probably still be to then crash into Ganymede ultimately at the end. Any other questions online? Okay, we got one here in the room. 
excellent presentation. I was wondering, considering that astronomers are now looking at habitability in terms of, you know, the habitable zone, in terms of temperature around a star, does it even make sense to think of a habitable zone around a giant planet um, in terms of, say, gravity or magnetic fields, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So there's a lot still that we don't understand, like, what life needs, right? So I know some colleagues of mine are really interested in, you know, does life need a magnetic, like, does the body have to have a magnetic field of its own, sort of to have that protective this from all the you know harsh radiation and plasma or now you know at, at like at jupiter is it enough that uh, jupiter has a strong magnetic field um, that's inducing a field at europa um, and so i think there could be thoughts about you know with the larger planets and then their moons um what what that sort of i don't know niche environment or however you want to think about it is um you know, that could be an environment too, right? That you could consider like where where is that moon in relation to the, the parent planet and what kind of magnetic field and radiation is coming from the parent planet and then relating also to the star, depending on the star that it's it's near to. Um, I think all of that has to be taken into consideration. It's harder for us to think about detecting ocean worlds in the sense of um, that the, for the exoplanets, there are, I mean, there's efforts for sure to do this, but if it's an ice, icy surface with not much of an atmosphere, you know, you're not going to be able to tell as much about the subsurface yet, but, 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 but linking them to that niche environment, I think is an, is an important way to think about it. Well, again, thank you very much. Any other last time, last offer for more questions? I see people are dropping off, so I guess that's an answer. <laughs> but, uh, but we thank you very much for your time, ma'am. It was very, it was a great presentation. Um, certainly, um, we have an opportunity to ask you back because you, there's a lot of time between here and the time we get out there. But but it's been really great having you with us tonight, and and I hopefully you didn't miss too much on the Super Bowl. But um, that's okay. <laughs> it'll, 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 that's right. That's what we, yeah. It's, It'll I'm all much be more of a soccer fan anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's great. Well, again, thank you very much and have a good evening. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Let's just shut it off, I guess. Now we're just going to conclude the meeting? Yeah, so let's just. So anyway, uh, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. We actually ended, had it almost up to over 40 at one point. So people did come. A lot of things going on, remember, um, and a lot of opportunities for outreach. And so please stay in touch and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you out there at the observing sites and then uh, let us know what we can do to help you. Thank you. Have a good evening.